Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm Gina. Okay, that was not even remotely acceptable. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Gina Matthews, and this is Ronnie Bull. Um, I'm a computer science professor from Clarkson University in way, way upstate New York, almost Canada, knows believe New York, as we like to call it. Uh, and uh, Ronnie is both a professor type at Utica College and also finishing up his PhD uh, at Clarkson. And we're going to talk about layer two network security in virtualized environments. So first, a little roadmap of what we're going to do today. First, we're going to do a little bit of context, a little background to set the stage. Um, we're going to talk about some very basics of virtualization, multi-tenant environments, and cloud services. And we're going to talk a little bit about networking basics, both physical and virtual. Then we're going to talk about the platforms that we use to do our testing, um, the hypervisor platforms, the virtual networking devices that we tested and things like that. And then we're going to get into the good stuff, the actual attacks and uh, the, the results that we obtained. In particular, we're going to look at MAC flooding attacks and DHCP attacks in virtualized environments. We're going to talk about some mitigations for these attacks and some next steps and conclusions. All right, so. This might be starting a little basic for some folks, but just to make sure that we are all on the same page, uh, virtualization 101, right? We have used to have a bunch of physical servers, and now we've converted these all to virtual machines, and they are living happily together on one physical box. They're co-located together on one physical virtualization server. And uh, that's one step in the plot thickens. The next step in the plot thickens is that they are likely sharing a virtual networking device, a physical networking device, um, out of this one virtualization server. And the third step in the plot thickens is the virtual machines that are co-located together on the same physical box may not belong to the same trust domain. So this is the classic example. If you look carefully, you can see some virtual machines that belong to competitors. Some belong to Coke and some belong to Pepsi. And what the question is, what can they do to one another since they happen to land co-located together in the same physical machine? Um, if one of these VMs is malicious, what type of attacks could they do to the other VMs on the system? And just to emphasize the importance of what we're talking about, um, multi-tenant cloud services like this model are all over the place. You know, Amazon EC2, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Services, lots of, you know, uh, less high-profile places do the same thing. And um, there's a lot of mission-critical applications being run in this way. Uh, most of these environments are running some form of Zen, whether it's open source Zen or Zen server. Some of them are using VMware or Hyper-V. And they're pretty much all sharing network connectivity between the tenants. I would like to emphasize that we did not do the testing of our attacks in EC2 or Azure or any of these places, but we'd love to. So if anyone in the audience is from Amazon or Microsoft or Google or any, you know, hosting environment and you'd like us to do some testing in your environment, no actual VMs would be hurt. Uh, we would love to come and do that. So come and talk to us afterwards, right? Okay. All right. So the key question uh, before us is since all of these client virtual machines are essentially connected to a virtual version of a physical networking device, they're sharing it. Do the layer two attacks, network attacks, that we all have known and loved for so long uh, still work when they're applied to their virtualized uh, versions? And um, yeah, cut to the chase, yes, most of them do. Uh, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, I did want to emphasize that this is not the only class of attacks that co-located VMs can do to one another. This is by no means the only source of nastiness. Our research group at Clarkson has done other things where, you know, we hammer the disk 
from one VM and we see, that, does it tank the performance of other VMs on the system or hammer the network with just a lot of traffic, not the kind of network attacks that we're talking about today, just allocate a huge amount of memory, you know, spin crazy on the CPU, all sorts of different things. And, the, and other research groups have uh, demonstrated, you know, amazing things like stealing people's encryption keys through cache effects and other side channel attacks. So this is by no means the only class of nastiness that virtual machines can do to one another when they happen to land next to one another in the cloud. And I would say that it's a, an old lesson uh, that you are vulnerable to those that are close to you. Uh, that's why we're all a little extra nervous being here at DEF CON, right? We're normally all spread out. <laughs> we're all together. Uh, okay. So the bottom line um, is that our, our experimental results show that virtualized network devices do have the potential to be exploited in the same manner as physical devices. Um, and that's going to be the heart of the demos that we're going to do today and show you the specifics of those attacks. And in fact, some, in some environments, those attacks can even spill out of the virtualized environment onto the physical networks they're connected to. Um, there's some good stories about that. Um, Mac flooding and Citrix Zen server uh, basically allowed eavesdropping on the physical network traffic. Uh, it basically flowed out, uh, uh, flooded the cam tables on all the physical switches <laughs> around also. Okay, so um, in that what if slide, I had a, a malicious VM and, you know, would say, what can that malicious VM do? In particular, today we're going to talk about, we're not going to demonstrate all of these, but um, here's the classes of things you can do. Capture all the network traffic from the victim VMs. That's bad, right? Redirect the victim VMs traffic someplace they didn't intend. That's bad. Perform a whole variety of man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, do denial of service gain unauthorized access to restricted subnetworks, and generally tank their performance. So those are all examples of nastiness. Okay, um, one more bit of just level setting review before we get into the details of the attacks. Uh, so a quick review of some networking basics. Um, so what are physical bridges? They're devices that connect two or more segments at layer two. They do separate collision domains, so they're maintaining MAC address forwarding tables, uh, and um, they're forwarding the requests based on the destination MAC address. Um, here we see, you know, the layer two Ethernet frame. Basically, the decision is being made based on that destination address, and here's the classic bridge picture. Uh, it's very simple. If a frame is sent in one domain and it's destined for something in that domain, it stays put and doesn't cross the bridge. If it's destined for another um, domain, it will be forwarded according to the information in that table. So virtual bridges are very similar. You can kind of think about them as the simplest form of virtual networking. Um, in particular, we were using the, the virtual uh, bridging support that's built into the Linux kernel and Bridge Utils user space package. And we actually found that in some cases it did better than some of the enterprise uh, switch solutions. So that was an interesting surprise. Um, then we also have switches. So physical switches operate also at layer two or higher. You can think about them as multi-port bridges. They also separate collision domains. Um, and they also have a dynamic table, a CAM table, a content addressable memory table. It's very similar to that bridge forwarding table. Um, and uh, it's also using the destination MAC address to figure out where to forward each frame, what port to forward each frame onto. And there's just, a, again, a kind of classic switching picture showing that the switch will, will keep track of which MAC address lives off of every port so it can successfully send only the frames destined for that port, uh, for that MAC address out that port in, when all is well. And virtual switches are much like their physical uh, counterparts. Um, they are a more advanced form of virtual networking than bridging. They can emulate layer two and higher physical devices. Um, and they can provide additional services such as quality of service, VLAN traffic separation, and performance and traffic monitoring as some examples. Okay, so with that kind of context set, I'm ready to hand over to Ronnie, uh, who's gonna tell you all about the cool attacks. Okay, we're going to discuss some of the attacks that we um, experimented with in these virtualized environments, uh, specifically the MAC flooding attack and the DHCP attack. Um, and there's a few scenarios for each attack that we're going to go over. Um, so this is the test environment that we use. There's a big rack of servers that were just dedicated for this work. Um, 
And here's some of the hardware specs for this particular uh, experimentation. We had uh, three servers running open source Zen um, on Gen2 Linux. Uh, one of them was running Linux bridging. The other one was running uh, open vSwitch 1.11.0. Then we had open vSwitch 2.0.0, a Citrix Zen server 6.2, um, Hyper-V, and then we had Hyper-V free, so we had the, the free version and then the actual full MS uh, 2008 server, uh, Hyper-V, and then VMware vSphere. So you can see the different specs here. They were fairly similar, but uh, in reality, with the testing we're doing, the hardware specs have no meaning to this because we're actually attacking the virtual switch. Uh, so let's talk about the Mac flooding attack. I see we have people up here. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so Mac flooding basically is we're, we're just taking um, a bunch of frames, uh, random frames, and we're flooding the switch with it to try to, to fill up that cam table. Um, when we fill up that cam table, the switch goes into a hub mode, which basically forwards all the frames on the network to every device that's connected, um, breaking all those collision domains. No, 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 keep going. Oh, keep this going? Okay, good stuff. So here's an image of a Mac flooding attack occurring. You can just see a bunch of random Mac addresses going on here. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just flooding that network out. That's my computer. Is it? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> all right. Your computer's about to be toasted. I'm going to pause for a moment. All right. all right. You all know how this works. Are they doing a good job? <laughs> Thank you, sir. To our brand new speakers. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Deaf Guy. Hi. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> go okay. Back that, go back to that TCP flood screen. Whoa. Get <laughs> off it. Get off it. Away. <laughs> okay. So for our, our scenario, this is the basic network diagram we have. Um, we have a target virtual machine running Kali Linux, and then the attacker is also running Kali Linux. It was just pretty easy to set that up. Uh, the virtual switch, all connected to the physical interface. It's connected up to the physical network, you know, switching infrastructure, then, a, you know, a gateway router going out to the internet. Um, so let's show some demos. Uh, it depends on the uh, virtualized environment. So if we go back up here to this slide, oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't there. Uh, here we, well, the Mac flooding summary, I guess I'll show the demos after this. Um, open source Zen with Linux bridging, we also had the Open vSwitch, we had Citrix Zen server, which was also running Open vSwitch, uh, an older version, 1.4.6. Uh, Microsoft Hyper-V with the Hyper-V virtual switch, and then the free version also with the Hyper-V virtual switch, and then VMware vSphere. So that kind of spilled the beans there. But let's uh, take a look at some of these demos. Hopefully they'll, they'll work. It's a reduced resolution, and I had to um, test them out here. But it's, they may not, you may not be able to see the text too well, but they are on the CD. So if you have the DEF CON CD, you can view them. Um, so here basically we're seeing the Linux bridge mode. Uh, we have a virtual machine running Gen2 Linux, uh, running Zen and virtual, uh, just kernel bridging. Uh, you can see in this first uh, window here, we're just showing the, the network interface, um, showing the, the configuration and bridge mode, showing that the actual interface providing for the virtual machines does not have an IP address, it's just bridged. Uh, then we have two virtual machines. The one in the middle is the, um, the target, and the one all the way over is the, uh, the attacker system. So on the attacking system, we're just going to fire up Wireshark, um, and we can see we're just starting to see ARP traffic, general broadcast traffic going across that. Um, what we'll do is we'll apply an HTTP filter and start running the Mac flooding attack just using MacOff, um, which has been around since 1999. So you can see the Mac flooding attack running over there on the side, um, and then we can see Wireshark, and in Wireshark we can see a bunch of malformed packets flooding the network. Uh, so this is just an indication that something's going on here. Now, if we apply the HTTP filter, we just want to view to see if we can see the uh, target system's web traffic, uh, see if we can get some plain text information out of that. So we really shouldn't be able to do that in a switched environment, um, but this is a bridged environment. Um, so it's loading up the, the filter here, um, filtering all the past packets, and then over on the, the target system, we're just going to start surfing the web. And we can see that really nothing interesting is happening in the Wireshark window. So basically what's going on here is Linux bridging is preventing... Um, the Mac flooding attack from actually being successful in this case. So let's take a look at what happens when we actually do this on Open vSwitch uh, 2.0.0. So again, in that first window, that's the, uh, the hypervisor, the host, it's just Gen2 Linux. Um, and again, I'm just showing off uh, the basic networking configuration for this system. It's, uh, it has a management interface set up with a dedicated IP. 
Um, and then it has a second interface set up for the use for the virtual switch, for OpenV switch. And then we can see here the configuration for OpenV switch. There's a couple VMs that are, that are attached to it and running. Um, so again, in the middle we have the, the target and over on the side we have the attacking system. Um, highlighting the IP addresses there. We're going to open up the web browser on the target system and again start running Wireshark on the attacking system. So we were very systematic in our approach here. We use the same VMs all the time, same process. We're seeing the ARP traffic, we apply the HTTP filter and then we're going to start running the MAC flooding attack. So flooding the network. And then we'll start surfing the web over on uh, the target system and pretty much immediately we start seeing the HTTP packets coming up in Wireshark. So at this point we are acquiring all the network traffic uh, from that target system. The stuff that should be prevented through the, the collision domain protection. So in this video we, we, we go a little more deeper and we start looking at some of the packets here after we've gathered enough of them. Uh, so let's just gather a few more here and then it's a little hard to see up there but if you watch the video later you can see where we actually um, started inspecting some of these packets and we were able to pull out some of the clear text, all the header information. Um, but I, I go into showing uh, where you can actually look at um, the text on one of the web pages and view it in Wireshark. So it is actually passing the clear text over. It's just showing that demo here. Okay, that, that third video is going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of skip that third one, but it's just showing it on Open vSwitch on Citrix Zen server, and it does work. Um, so it's just using an older version of Open vSwitch, so feel free to look at that on YouTube or check it out on the, on the CD as well. Okay, so I've already showed this slide, but basic summary is that it worked in any Open vSwitch um, environment. Um, and the performance was impacted on every single environment. We can't talk about VMware because in the VMware end user and license agreement it specifically states they are not allowed to publish um, or, or talk about in a public venue performance benchmarking results without prior consent from VMware. So, um, NA. <laughs> but when you look at what happens to, to basic networking over that uh, connection when the MAC flooding attack is occurring, you can see something like this. So this was performed, uh, this test was gathered on a bridged interface. Um, the first 60 ICMP requests, uh, there was no MAC flooding attack running, so we got a baseline there. And you can see it's really low. And what I was doing is just pinging um, a server one hop away from the virtualized switch. So we were just going out um, on the LAN to a server out there and just pinging it to see what we were getting. So you can see it's a really low latency there for the first 60 ICMP packets. Then as soon as we start that MAC flooding attack, it starts gradually increasing up, and then all of a sudden that flood has just really happened and we got a lot of variation in, in latency there, peaking out at almost 130, 140 milliseconds. Um, and then as soon as we cut off that MAC flooding attack, we can see it drop right down to nothing, back to the baseline again. So um, you can really see that the performance does get impacted here on the network um, when running this attack. Okay, so we did our due diligence and we reported this vulnerability. We, uh, we notified cert.org. We got assigned the VU number there. Um, haven't received anything from Mitra.org for a CVE yet, uh, so we were hoping we'd hear something from them. Uh, we did report it to Open vSwitch and they immediately responded with a patch. So any version of Open vSwitch from 2.0.0 and higher has been patched to, uh, to alleviate this or mitigate this attack. Um, so feel free to test it out and if you want to go to that link, the slides are available on the CD as well. Um, you can actually read the whole details of that patch um, and everything that it entails and actually see the source code as well. Okay, so traditionally um, these attacks on physical networks are mitigated by using port security to limit the actual MAC addresses that can accumulate on a port um, so they actually don't hit that threshold where the, where the CAN table gets overflowed and we start flooding that network. Um, we can all also allow, you know, authorized MAC addresses. We just specifically say you, you're the only system that connect to this port and that will help mitigate this attack too so that we can't, you know, make that CAM table limit hit. Um, or we can just disable unused ports, but this stuff doesn't really work on virtual switches. Port security is available on the Nexus 1000V, the Cisco, but it's the paid version and you need to run that either in a VMware environment or a Hyper-V environment. So it's very costly to get into that level of protection. So these other, these other virtual switches, hopefully they can br be brought up to speed, um, even especially like open source versions to actually offer this kind of security because we are getting into the virtualized world here and this is very important. Um, okay, let's discuss DHCP attacks. So the basic of the DHCP protocol, we can use this to allocate network information, IP address information to a bunch of uh, machines on a network. Makes things a lot simpler for administrators. Um, things like subnet mass, default gateway, all the essentials you need to actually be on a network can be allocated through DHCP. Uh, the basic client server protocol, um, the client broadcasts out for, for an address, 
the server responds um, with a lease information or an offer, and then the client broadcasts back saying, yeah, sure, I'll take that. Um, and then the server acknowledges it, and then we have this lease established, right? We can actually have an IP address and all the information we need from that server. Um, DHCP allows for options, so if you take a look at RFC 2132, you're going to find there's about 255 different options available to pass through DHCP. Some things are like time server, domain names, ARP cache, all sorts of good stuff. Um, so really to perform a DHCP attack, we've got to put a rogue DHCP server that we're in control of on the network. And that's going to compete with a legitimate DHCP server to actually provide address information, network information to clients on that network. And this really has a 50-50 chance of actually being successful. And if you actually put multiple rogue DNA or DHCP servers on a network, um, you're going to be able to increase that, that probability. And this is very simple. We were using DNS mask. You can set this up in about five minutes or less uh, to actually do this stuff on a basic CentOS VM. So we have a few conditions here uh, and a few scenarios we ran. So duplicate addressing, um, basically you try to identify the IP range that the, the legitimate DC DHCP server is passing out and you try to mimic that on your rogue server and try to do some duplicate uh, addressing attacks where you're just going to cause denial of service. Um, so basically a denial of service conflict in that. And here's just a graphic illustrating we have a legitimate DHCP server and a malicious one. And the first two clients get their addresses from that legitimate server, but we can see that third client got it from the, the malicious server and it's in conflict with, with the first client. So we have a problem there on our network. Okay, a rogue DNS server. If we have a rogue DNS server, if we're running a DHCP server, we can provide DNS information, primary DNS server information for those systems on that network. So if we're in control of the DHCP server, we're running something like DNS mask, well that also doubles as a DNS server. Uh, so now we can use that to actually provide false or poison DNS information to the clients on our network. And really the effect of that is we're directing those, that, that traffic to where we want it to go. Um, so we can actually start stealing information, harvesting information if we're directing to web servers we are, we're in control of. Um, so basically this is a rogue DNS server attack where we have on the, on the top a legitimate server, client asks for, for Gmail, um, it gets back the IP address for gmail.com, the legitimate address. Um, but if we have a, a malicious server on there, we, we can direct it to wherever we want it to go. Okay, the incorrect, uh, incorrect default gateway was another attack we tried, so we're providing just incorrect information um, and basically just calling a, causing a denial of service attack for those uh, systems on the network that is trying to get outside of the network to different subnets or different resources outside of the LAN. Um, a malicious honey net was, the, was another attack we used, so instead of giving you know, just a, a bad default gateway address, we actually ran up a router system on another VM, pointed the clients to that router system, and then routed the traffic through that and kind of mirrored um, the production network within the malicious honey net to try to gather information um, by doing that. So this is just an image that's showing that we have client A um, going through a regular default gateway and this sits happily getting to where it needs to be, but client B um, associated with a, with a rogue DHCP server got a bad default gateway and its traffic was directed to that HoneyNet for collection. And finally, we did remote execution of code. So when we started this research on, on DHCP attacks, it was right around the time when Shellshock was, was big. Um, so we were trying to figure out what we could do with that. Um, so by making use of uh, the, the DHCP options, we found that we could use Shellshock to actually run remote execution of code on, on these systems. Um, and what happens is, is we have a lease time on DHCP. So every time that the lease refreshes itself, that code is ran. So we can kind of use this as kind of a mock-up cron job on the systems. Uh, so the effect really, you know, this could be catastrophic, this could be harmless, we could use it to set an MOTD, we could use it to SCP our shadow file out to some email address or some other server, um, and we can recursively delete the system as it's booting up right after it get, uh, gathered its IP address information. So the basic protocol is the same, you know, we're doing that, that client server exchange for our IP address information, but at the end here we're, we're, we're passing that option 100 or option 114 and we're throwing out the shell shock attack and in this case we're, we're passing the RM minus RF forward slash with that shell shock attack um, to delete the system. Uh, so the test environment for this was the same as the MAC flooding attack where we're just reproducing the stuff on the, on the same environments that we had built there. Um, but we did need to expand the virtual machines beyond the Kali system, so we, we fired up uh, four CentOS VMs. Uh, one was configured as that, that DHCP and DNS server. Um, then we had a simple router system to do that malicious honey net attack. Um, and then we set up a basic web server to use for doing our poison DNS attacks, and we'll show you another demo here in a little bit uh, of another way we use that. Um, and then our final system was just a client system left vulnerable to shell shock, so we could actually uh, do a proof of concept with that. 
So the actual scenarios we did for the remote execution of code, you can see that we passed that option 100 and that's the exact code that we ran with that. So we were just doing a proof of concept, fairly harmless uh, attack on here and we just echoed out uh, testing Shellshock vulnerability, if you can read this, it worked, uh, to a file in slash temp called Shellshock. Uh, we also tested to see what kind of access we had by using the ID command. So when we passed the ID command, um, instead of just bin echo, we just did um, bin ID and that passed in. And actually when the client received its IP address information from the DHCP server, it showed that it was running as root. Um, so with the Poison DNS server, we just basically uh, gave it the Poison DNS server information and then passed it to spoof uh, Gmail, mail.google.com and www.gmail.com to steal the user credentials. Infall default gateway, invalid default gateway attack, we passed uh, 1.1.1.1. Um, so just basically denial of service to the systems. And then the malicious default gateway, we gave it that 1.20 address, uh, which was our system, our router system set up to pass it out to another HoneyNet. So how do we monitor for this? How do we actually see that we were really having a 50-50 probability between our legitimate and our rogue servers? We just use TCP dump. So here's a simple bash script that was written um, just to gather information uh, for the DHCP handshake, if you will. And it produced output like this where we just saw the, the, the broadcast traffic coming between the, the clients and the servers. And we can actually, if you look into this, you can actually see um, that it was about a 50-50% chance that you would hit that rogue DHCP server. So what I was just doing is running DH client service. I'd, I'd run it once. I'd watch the TCP dump output. I'd kill it, run it again, kill it, run it again, and just keep collecting. And it pretty much bounced back and forth. Uh, so 192.168, 1.2 was a legitimate server and 1.3 was the rogue server. And you can see here it was just going back and forth, back and forth. Um, so in order to do the ID test, just to verify we were actually running as root once we ran the shellshock command, uh, we just did user bin ID um, and it produced this output on the client when we ran DH client and just showed that we were running as the UID of root, um, the GID of root. So we were in the root user root group. And to summarize these attacks, it worked on everything. Every attack, every scenario we did worked across the board. There was no protection um, against these attacks default out of the box um, for any of the hypervisor environments that were, that were experimented with. So we have a few demos here for this. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, we're gonna skip the Poison DNS server one just for time since it is fairly basic. We're just running that DHCP server and pushing it out. But we wanna kinda show you these shell shock ones and hopefully they come out good. Okay. Okay, so here we have um, a shell shock system which is just that client system that's vulnerable to shell shock and on the other end uh, we have the rogue DHCP server. Um, so if we look at the resolve.conf we can see that the system originally grabbed its IP address from the legitimate DHCP server. Um, and temp just contains yum.log. So it's just a standard installation, there's nothing else in there. Now what we do is we're, we're going we're gonna to restart the DHCP service or the DH client service here um, to pull a new address and try to grab one from that rogue uh, DHCP server. And just wait a few for the process to occur. And while it's waiting, take a look at the dnsmass.conf file and we can see the DHCP range was just specified by a one-liner here and we can see we uh, did 200 to 254 and we did a lease time of one minute to cycle through the leasing just to see what we could do just to get it going quickly so we could verify that it was actually refreshing. Uh, we set the default gateway to 192.168.1.1 and if we go down a little further in that config file we can see the shell shock attack here that we, we passed out that echo command testing shell shock and trying to uh, write it into temp. So over here, uh, the client pulled the, the DNS information from the, the rogue DHCP server, so we know we actually got an address from that rogue DHCP server. So the shell shock uh, command should have ran um, on that client system. So if now we check uh, the contents of temp, oh, and actually uh, an interesting thing is every time the system either pulled from a legitimate DHCP server or the um, the rogue one, it actually pulled the same IP address because it just requested it each time. So there we can see that the shell shock file was written to that client through DHCP. Um, and if we cat out the file, we can see that it actually contains the information we wanted to place in that file. And we can see it was written as the root user as well.
And over here you can see on the side in the dnsmass.com file, I'm just comparing, um, showing that uh, what we actually pushed through actually went through. Now if we, we just wait about a minute or so, so you're going to see on the video, I'm just going to keep trying the date command just to see what's going on here, but we're going to see it actually got written again. It overwrites the file. Um, it just takes a couple seconds here because what happens is when you run, it actually doesn't happen on the exact minute. Uh, when you run the DH client command, it goes through the whole process of getting the lease and everything, and sometimes that goes beyond the minute and then it actually, it actually hits it. So I was sitting here kind of being impatient running the command and... Um, it does end up uh, going across the next minute to, to push the shell shock there. So we go back up, we look at the lease time as one minute here. Um, and if we just do the LS over on the other side again, we can see that it indeed wrote it. The first timestamp was 1436 and the next timestamp was 1437. So I was actually able to write that every minute if I wanted to. Okay. So that was just our basic proof of concept attack um, just to see if it worked. So then we asked, well, what can we really do with this? I mean, that's great. We can write to temp, right? We can put a file in there. whoop de doo um, But how can we actually use this to leverage it and actually gain full root access to that client system? Um, so what we did is we figured maybe we'll try to play with some SSH keys and see what we could do. So the same scenario, same setup. We have our, our client system and we have our, our uh, rogue DHCP server over here. Um, and we're just going to try to SSH over the system first, and we see that it's prompting us for a password. So there's no key information in use right now on that other system. Um, so next what we're going to do is we're just going to look at that, uh, the host file on the system, and we see that it is using DNS mask, which uses the host file to actually provide DNS information on the system. And we can see that we have a web server running on 192.168.1.10 that's providing uh, the name of web, as well as the Gmail stuff that we were spoofing before. Um, and if I SSH over to that system uh, and we look at the var www HTML directory, we can see the contents in there. There's an index.html and a file called bad key that I put in there. So this is, figure this is my, my web server I control out there in the world and it's my, my server I'm going to try to use to, to host that key that I'm going to push over to the client system. And there if we cat it out, we can see the public key that was generated using um, the key gen, SSH key gen command. Um, so we'll leave the, the web server and go back over here and look at the, the dnsmass.com file. Um, well, there was blank on the tail there, but let's see. Okay, so at the end of here we can see now I'm using a little bit more intricate command. I'm actually using curl um, to pull down that bad key file from the web server and then I'm redirecting that um, to root.ssh authorized keys on the client system. So when we run DHCP, this is the actual command it's going to be using. So it's going to go out there, it's going to try to download that, that key file and place it directly in the, um, the root user's authorized keys file. So we'll go around the client, um, we'll check out the authorized keys file and see if it's there. There's no authorized keys file currently on that client system. So it was never placed in there. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll try to, to obtain an address from that system. But first, uh, if over on here, we're, we're looking at the, the root directory on the, the rogue DHCP server, and we can see there's a public and private key um, in the .ssh folder. And if we cat out that file, the, uh, the public key, we'll see that it's the same public key that is on the web server that's being pushed down um, to the client through DHCP. So going back over on the client, we'll just rerun the DH client service to try to pull a new address from the rogue server. And after a few, a little bit of time here, um, we should get our information and we hopefully we'll see that the authorized keys file is placed in the uh, .ssh folder. And there it is, written by root. But well, great, we wrote the file, but does it work, right? So. Um, if we go back over, oh, let's cat it out. We can see here that we got double entries in. Um, what happened is I believe when I ran DH client, I ran it kind of right at the tail end of the minute. It wrote it once and then because I was redirecting and, and uh, doing a, a pen instead of an overwrite, it just added a, another entry of that key. So, you know, good housekeeping when you get in the system, clear up that authorized keys file. Um, you should be good to go. So again, over here we see we're using that curl command, um, redirecting, and that's why we got that double entry. And then... We should just try to test the SSH into it. 
So if we look at our history, we're going to go back and we're just going to grab that same command that we used the first time. So instead of just typing it all again, um, going into 192.168.1.226, which is the shell shock system, and it went right in. So it didn't even prompt for the password this time. So our authorized keys file was pushed over there and it was effective for getting us root access to that system. Um, so if we ID, we can see that we are the root user on that system. Uh, exit out, try it again. And of course the last log should say that we came from um, the rogue DHCP server. So it was effective. Okay, so how can we mitigate these attacks? Um, enforcing static addressing, so a DHCP server is right out of the question. Um, but it does get cumbersome. If you have a really large environment um, and you're really depending on DHCP for your address allocation, uh, this, this could cause some issues. Um, we could also use DHCP snooping on switches. This is usually effective in the physical world, but again, it's not really there yet in the virtualized switched environment. Um, it's an option on some physical switches like Cisco and HP. Um, we could also restrict access to, for specific MAC addresses uh, to those systems, but this is highly re uh, restrictive. Or DHCP server authorization in Windows environments. So Windows 2000 server and up, if you have an Active Directory environment and you're running a whole Windows DHCP servers, um, you can actually do DHCP authorization, but really who wants to run a whole Windows environment? Um, so we could also explore techniques and software defined networking. So ideas maybe um, defining filters to identify these DHCP requests and, and, and transfers. Um, say, hey, this is the real legitimate DHCP server. If I see any other addresses um, broadcasting on this network, we're just going to ignore them. We're going to route those clients to the correct place. Um, so most virtual switches these days, especially Open vSwitch, allow you to actually integrate with like OpenFlow. Um, so this is a good way to move forward in this to actually try to, to use software defined networking to prevent some of this from occurring. One thing we did find, um, especially in the SendOS environments, that when I started running the Shellshock tests, um, I was able to write the temp fine because it was Chmod 777, it was world writable, it worked great. Um, but when I started doing that SSH key attack, it didn't work. And I was wondering, well, I have root access, why isn't it working? Um, down to SE Linux. So a lot of system administrators disable SE Linux um, right out of the box. It's enabled in CentOS uh, and Red Hat distributions. So what this was doing is it was preventing it from occurring. It was seeing this network service trying to write um, to a non-world writable folder or file um, and it just said, no, you can't do it. So it never worked until I actually disabled SE Linux and then I could write my, my files anywhere I wanted to. Um, so take this into consideration. SE Linux will help prevent from writing um, like this authorized keys attack because you can't write to anywhere except for temp. But it does not work for any of the other DHCP attacks that we were trying out. Um, or any of the MAC flooding attacks for that matter. So looking ahead, we intend to move forward into looking at VLANing, um, VLAN hopping attacks specifically to see if we can actually start hopping different VLANs in the virtualized environments. Um, so you know, we're trying to separate uh, d domains, logically separate and isolate these systems through, through VLANing on the network. And most virtual switches offer this capability. So by using things like double tagging or switch spoofing, can we actually um, break these VLAN separations on these networks? Um, so we'll have to see. Maybe we'll come back next year and, and present our research and results on this. Um, okay, so Gina? All right, so was that scary? Maybe a little bit. Um, okay, so to wrap this up, um, all the layer two vulnerabilities we discussed were targeted towards the virtual networking devices, not the hypervisors in particular. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, not every virtual switch product is available on every hypervisor. Um, and we, as you saw, the results show that the virtual networking devices can be just as vulnerable as their physical counterparts to these classic attacks, um, MAC flooding and rogue DHCP and all these kind of things. Um, we're going to continue to work on this, as Ronnie said. Um, it's good to know that Zen Server and any other solutions you, using Open vSwitch are vulnerable to eavesdropping out of the box right now, um, although there is that patch, so uh, you should get that. Um, and all the environments that we tested were vulnerable to every type of the DHCP man attack manipulations that we did, so that's a really good one to know as well. Um, so a single malicious virtual machine running in a multi-tenant environment has the potential to sniff all the traffic that's going over that virtual switch. Um, and you saw some of the devastating effects it can have. Um, 
It's obviously a significant threat to confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data that's passing over these networks in, you know, virtualized multi-tenant environments, you know, the, the cloud service environments that are being used for tons of production stuff right now. Um, and, uh, this, all these results definitely indicate that a full assessment of layer two network security in multi-tenant environments is, is warranted and important. And we hope that some of the takeaway actions people will have is to really question their hosting providers about what they're running. Um, are there any mitigation steps that they're taking? Ask for that, push for that, um, encourage auditing of the workload. And we'd be happy to help with that, I think we mentioned. <laughs> um, auditing the work, the risk of the workloads that you run in the cloud, thinking about these issues. I mean, you have no idea who, you're being, who you just landed with um, in these multi-tenant environments. And consider some extra security measures, some for the, the users and some for the service providers. So increased use of encryption would obviously be good. Um, and additional service monitoring um, and additional steps to detect these threats, to notice this kind of traffic happening um, and alerting. So, great. Uh, we'd be happy to take some questions. That's what the, yeah, that's the next thing we really want to work on. Well, we did notice that the, um, when the MAC flooding was running, it did break the VLANs. So it, it just, it broke the VLAN separation right out, right out of the bat when it turned into the hub mode. So in Wireshark, you were able to actually see all the VLAN tags all, on all the frames on uh, whatever system you were sniffing? We didn't specifically look for that at the time, but we, we did see that we could see traffic on other VLANs, especially when, when we ran it on Citrix Zen server and it flooded the upstream switches and then we could start seeing all the traffic on all the VLANs from those upstream switches as well. Uh, so it really, it really got pretty bad. I mean, we, we flooded close to 100 switches and put them all in, uh, in hub mode. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, if yes. you have questions, come down here to the front. And uh, if you are leaving, please leave through the back doors, not the side doors, please. It'll just help with the congestion out in the hallways. Thank you. Uh, on the uh, VMware tests, you guys indicated they weren't vulnerable to the MAC flooding. Did you test any of the workloads with allowed forge transmits set or just their default? It was just settings. the default ESXi virtual switch that okay. we tested, and we just did the same exact test on every platform. So it was just the, what you saw in the demo, the MAC flooding attack. Okay. Um, so Thanks. nothing beyond that at the point. Uh, on the People Linux have side. suggestions of specific configurations that they think would be interesting to test on those products. That would be another thing we'd be happy to hear. Uh, on the Linux side, uh, which virtualized NICs did you use? Oh, sorry. On the Linux side, did you which virtualized NICs did you use, like E1000 versus Vertio, and also uh, did you try testing like KVM versus Zen? Uh, we didn't use KVM versus Zen because we were really looking to open vSwitch. So the, the switching mechanism was the important part here. And if you're using KVM or, or Zen, you're, you're using open vSwitch anyway. So the hypervisor doesn't really matter. It's the virtual switch implementation. Um, we were using open source Zen, and we were just using straight XL commands. So no over-the-top kind of higher layer um, interaction for management. It was just straight command line XL. Okay. Did you try any different uh, virtualized NIC drivers, like Vert.io versus E1000? Like no. you were saying. Okay, no. No, we didn't. Thank you, though. I, um, so my question is, your testing appeared to be like on a flat layer two network only. Um, have you guys tested this across uh, a routed switch network where you'd be implementing something like IP helper addresses to forward clients to a specific address rather than relying on picking up DHCP requests across a flat network? Uh, no, we were just looking in the, the specific LAN itself and then we were moving forward to the VLAN attacks next. So. Um, that is, so, so, and I mean, the reason why I asked that in a multi-tenant environment, <clears throat> you would typically never be picking up off of a local DHCP server. You'd be routed back to your corporate network to your own personal DHCP address or DHCP server. So unless you had a DHCP server that was spoofing the DHCP ad uh, server address, this should not be happening across a multi-tier network, right? If you send us a... Um, email with us some specific things you think would be great to test. We would really love that. And okay. if you have an, you know, like I said, we'd love to test more environments. 
in uh, in my network, we use uh, DHCP guard on the physical ports. Do uh, such technologies exist in the virtual switches? Have not seen anything on the virtual switches yet. Maybe when you get into the higher, the, the, the paid Cisco uh, versions, there might be some implementation of that, but I haven't seen it. Like yeah, the Nexus. Not the free version, though. I would think it would be in the paid version. Do you have any theories or if you've got any information about EC2 or any of the inf infrastructure as a service things? Um, any information that you've gotten either from documentation or stuff like that? Also, I'm from Potsdam. Oh, right on. The, oh, oh, go ahead, Jenna, first. I was just going to say you should come uh, visit us at the labs. So the only thing we really know of about EC2 is that they use Zen and they use Open vSwitch, but then they have their higher level controls on top of that as well that they've implemented. So other than that, it's, it's kind of safely guarded, you know. So we were really trying to get into there, but it's, it's been fairly difficult. Yeah, I've, I've been through some inf information sessions with AWS, and they definitely make you sign non-disclosure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. So, so it sounds like you did this, like you said, all on one flat layer two network. So in a multi-tenant environment, they also may deploy just as a bunch of layer two networks. I'd be surprised if they put the same tenants in the same layer two, although it's possible. Uh, I just wonder if you thought about that. And the other thing, uh, 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 a lot of these attacks are possible in a physical network and a typical physical network, but I, I totally agree with you that these attacks could be prevented in a virtual network. They have a lot more ability to look for that kind of thing. And the stakes are the stakes are higher because in the physical world you can control who you're next to and in the virtual world you can't as much. There, there should be more control, I agree. Uh, did you test against uh, ARP spoofing uh, attacks? Can't hear you too well. Did, did you test uh, these things against ARP spoofing attacks? And if you did, uh, also if virtual switches can have a ARP proxy? I'm still not quite understanding. Are you? Yeah, um, maybe can, can you come up right after? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk after. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, I was wondering if y'all were using uh, the standard VMware switches or the distributed switches. It was standard. We were gonna. We're starting to set up the environment for the Nexus to do the distributed switching, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. We were we were acquiring licensing and funding to do that, but we're getting there. Yeah, but we would need to set up multiple VMware environments and then do the distributing there. But we, we're getting there. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks, everybody.